All right, well, good evening and welcome back to Tuesday Night Theology. So glad that you guys chose to join with us tonight to talk, to start diving into some of the deeper end of the, of the theological work that we have here. So hopefully we came with our, uh, our minds clear and ready to learn. But before we get started, let's, uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that we have the opportunity to gather here. You have given us another day. We thank you that uh, in your providence, you have allowed us to wake up this morning and you've given us breath and you've strengthened us all through the day. I pray that as we are gathered here tonight, that your, uh, that your spirit would, would open our hearts and our minds so that we could understand you more clearly and I'd be able to apply that into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So during this past COVID season, uh, you guys have all been a part of it, we started getting uh, these random phone calls. And so my wife picked up the phone one day, they were calling her number, and uh, so she picked it up and there was a pleasant lady on the other end of the phone. And this lady said, ma'am, would, it, would you be okay if I read some scripture with you? Just read some scripture um, and then I can pray with you and then we'll just go on with that. Ashley said, my wife said, absolutely, that's no problem at all. Uh, so this lady, she would read scripture, different ones, and then she would hang up and a couple of weeks later, you get another phone call, same lady. Would you mind? I know that this is uh, kind of lunchtime and maybe she started to learn our, Ashley's schedule. Uh, this is lunchtime. I know that your kids uh, are doing lunch right now and this might be a good opportunity. Would you like for me to read some scripture with you? Ashley said, absolutely. A little bit more scripture can't hurt while we're doing homeschool and all the other things that we're doing. A couple weeks later, phone call again, same lady. It's getting closer to Easter and, uh, and at this time she said, uh, would you be interested in uh, being a part of our virtual Passover meal? Ashley, she said, uh, the lady said, because uh, Jesus commands us to celebrate his death. And Ashley said, well, we, we celebrate. We absolutely love to celebrate Jesus' death, his, his burial, and his resurrection. Uh, so sure, if you want to send me the invitation to be a part of that, we, we may be a part of that or we, we may not. I can't promise you anything, but um, sure, send me the invitation. And so uh, she's expecting a, a phone call or, or a message that says, here's the link to get to it. So she's waiting, waiting, and waiting, and waiting. So we get a, a mail, something in the mail uh, from this lady uh, with a nice letter. And in that, there were some materials, uh, and the website on that was jw.org. So this lady was from the Jehovah's Witnesses, and she was trying to, uh, to draw us uh, by scripture reading into uh, the Jehovah's Witness uh, uh, religion. So she called again, and my wife was graciously talked to her about Jesus and about what we believed about him. And, uh, and she has yet to call back. But uh, if she does, uh, we, are, we are ready. Um, maybe that's an experience that you've had. Uh, I think that it's gone from door to door to the phone book now is kind of the, the medium in which to find people. And, and maybe you've had that experience with uh, someone who knocked at your door. Uh, maybe a lady and a, and a man that came to your door and knocked on the door and, and said, we'd like to talk with you about scripture and about Jesus. And the question I think that we sometimes have to ask ourselves is, do we run and hide whenever they come to the door? Like, do you find something to do? Do you turn all the lights off? Pretend like we're not home so that they don't know that we're here. Or do you open the door with delight because you know you have an opportunity to tell someone about the greatness of God, about who he is and what he has done? Well, the doctrine that we're gonna talk about tonight is one of those doctrines that is, uh, that is disputed in terms of uh, other religious uh, sects, uh, but as we will come to find out, um, what Herman Bavink, a theologian, says, he says this about the doctrine of the Trinity. He says, in the doctrine of the Trinity beats the heart of the whole revelation of God for the redemption of humanity. So rather than the Trinity just being a, a heady exercise of, of thought and trying to figure out some, some interesting facts, it is really the heart of the whole revelation of God. It is the heart of the gospel and what God has done for us as people, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So as we kind of get rolling here, um, I just want us to get a few preliminary things out of the way, really uh, just a couple of them. Uh, the first is this, where did the term Trinity come from. Now, it wasn't in your book. Uh, it says that it's not in the Bible, so you could search in your concordance. You can go look in the back of your book, uh, back of your Bible for hours and hours and hours. You can search in every T. It's not there. 
okay? I, I can tell you it is not in the concordance. So how did we uh, come to have this, this word, this word Trinity? Well, it actually originates in the writings of a church father uh, named Tertullian, okay? So Tertullian lived about 208 AD, and it is in his writings that we see the term, uh, it's a Latin word uh, called Trinitas, okay? Latin word Trinitas. It's in a document that he wrote called Against Praxius. Praxius was a heretic of the day, and Tertullian wrote this to describe the plurality of God, so that God exists in, uh, in three persons, that is a, a plural expression or pr- plural uh, information about God, uh, as he refuted this heretical view. And while the word Trinity is not found in the scriptures, we see the reality that God exists in triunity all over the scriptures. Uh, we see it, as you read, uh, first we see it in the Old Testament. We see evidences of the plurality of the persons of God. So this is just giving us a foundation to say, is it even in the Bible? Can we even find that God is spoken of in plural forms, okay, in plural plural language? We see this very clearly in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says, and then God said, so a singular God, said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In Genesis eleven seven, we remember this from the Tower of Babel. God says, come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And we see in Isaiah chapter six, verse eight, you remember this is after Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord in the temple. It says, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? In these instances, we see the plurality of persons by the use of the words our and us as it relates to particular actions, the actions of God. In the passage from Isaiah, we see uh, something extremely interesting. We see a singular form, I, uh, who shall I send, God speaking, and at the same time, uh, the plural us to describe God's communication the communication coming from the Lord. So we see it in terms of the language that is used, but we also see it uh, in dis- distinctions and descriptions. Right? One particular way and, and phrase that we see in the Old Testament is the phrase, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. You see it all over the Old Testament in various places. I want to take a look at a particular passage in Genesis chapter 16, uh, where we see the Lord talking to uh, Hagar. You remember this story? So the angel of the Lord found her, Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. What's interesting there is that over and over, who was the one that was speaking to her? The angel of the Lord. And at the same time, whenever she recounts this story, She says, the Lord who spoke to me, okay? So she equates this angel of the Lord with the Lord God himself. We see the same thing or something similar in Exodus chapter three. You remember when Moses interacts with the angel of the Lord in the burning bush, a very similar interaction as Hagar had where there is a uh, a reference to the angel of the Lord and then a direct connection to the Lord God himself. The, the point here is this, that the most regular communication that we think of of God in the Old Testament, think of the ways in which the prophets talk. 
They talk, thus saith the Lord. Or whenever God speaks, it is the Lord said to Moses or the Lord said to whoever it is. But here, we see this angel of the Lord, an angel oftentimes, is, or angel translated is messenger, also being referred to in particular instances, not every instance, but in particular instances, also being referred to as God. Lastly, we see a reference in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10. It says, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Here we see a personal being distinct from God, the Lord God, and we also see the ability, personal ability for this this being, this Holy Spirit to be grieved. Now, this doctrine relates to a doctrine we talked about before. So I'm gonna see if we can test our uh, recall memory uh, as it relates to doctrine. And I'm gonna give you the definition and I'm gonna see who can call it out the first, what doctrine this actually describes, okay? All right, so here's the definition. At every point of redemptive history, God ensured that scripture contained everything that he intended for his people to have, to study, and to obey. What doctrine is this describing? Yeah, the sufficiency of scripture, right? The sufficiency of scripture. Good job, you win. You win, that's right, (laughs) that was it. Uh, A round of applause, yes. Uh, I just said you win. Everybody thinks it's gonna be something. Um, So the same is true as we think about the doctrine of Trinity. We would love from Genesis chapter one for there to be, and God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three co-equal, co-eternal. We would love for that to be the case right from Genesis chapter one. But we understand that God reveals himself as the sufficiency of scripture helps us to understand as a triune God progressively throughout scripture. Now, I do want us to make clear here, because I don't want you to go away thinking, well, Jeff said that God progresses to become a trinity. He doesn't progress to become a triune God. He reveals himself progressively as a triune God. Okay, see the difference there? He doesn't change over the course of time to become a trinity. He is a trinity and he reveals himself in that way over the course of time. And at each point in history, he has given us everything that was necessary to be known about him, his person, his character, his attributes, and his works, so that we could have them, study them, and obey them. So he gave the people in the Old Testament as much information about his triune nature as he needed to, as he chose and saw fit, knowing that it was necessary for them. That was the amount that was necessary for them. We also see in the New Testament, a clearer picture of this doctrine. We see this specifically in Matthew chapter three, verses 16 and 17. It says, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We see also in, uh, in the, the Great Commission, the, the evidence of a clear formulation of the triune nature of God. Anytime that we baptize somebody, you hear this uh, from our church. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the, in the Matthew chapter three passage, we see a biblical example where all three persons of the Trinity are interacting in the same place and at the same time. We see this clearly from those passages. And I wanna make an observation for us tonight um, about how the New Testament writers approach this, okay? I want you to notice that Matthew does not seek to explain the mystery of the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He simply states the evidence regarding its truth. He doesn't seek to explain, now this is how it all works out, He just says, this is the reality in which we understand God. The reality is this, as we think about doctrine. Uh, John Hanna, who is a a historical theologian, he writes this, theology developed in the church as the need arose to answer critics who attacked the church's teachings. It emerged as the church was confronted with the need to defend and clarify its proclamation. 
So we see that the formal doctrine, doctrinal statements are oftentimes a need of the moment kind of formulation where there's a heresy or an attack against orthodox Christian belief and there needs to be someone who stands up in the face of that to clarify what doctrines mean. One such attack was made by a man named Marcion at the end of the first century and into, uh, and into the second, dealing with the very reality of God being the same God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He has a, uh, um, you don't want to be known uh, in church history as having a heresy named after you. Uh, so just if you're wondering, like if you're trying to make your claim to fame, don't go for heresy, all right? Pick something else um, because this, this guy, Marcion, uh, I love how one uh, pastor, Kevin DeYoung, describes it. He says this about this guy. He says, Marcion was one of the most successful heretics in the early church. That's an oxymoron right there. He was opposed by everyone who was anyone. For nearly a century after his death, he was the, the arch heretic, opposed by Polycarp, who called him the firstborn of Satan, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement, Tertullian, Hippolytus, and Origen. He was the, one of the few heretics that the Greek and Latin Christians united in condemning, all right? So that's not what you wanna have on, on your epitaph, all right? Everybody was against me. His theological error was this. He refused to believe that the God of the Old Testament was the same as the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. He believed that, it, that the Bible presented two completely different gods. The God of the Old Testament is wrathful and just. He's vengeful and he's mean. And the New Testament God, he's loving, he's gracious. He allows you to do what you want to. And this historical Marcion advanced what he thought was the true gospel of Jesus, denying that the God of Israel was the true God because of his wrath, contending that God is a deity only of love and compassion. So do we see, are we starting to see how the doctrine of the Trinity and seeing the progressive nature of it through the Bible can help us in understanding uh, these challenges? Because this, is, this in itself is actually part of one of the new kind of general heresies that goes on in our world today. So think about if someone came to you and you were talking to them and they, and they said this statement to you, you know, I think we should just love everyone. Let them do whatever they want to. The God of the Old Testament is so outdated and mean. I think the God of the New Testament really shows us we shouldn't judge and we should practice unconditional acceptance. Now, as you think about the doctrine of the Trinity, how might you be able to answer them that, no, this God is the same God and we see how he reveals himself progressively? How might you be able to help somebody see that? Just a few answers if you have something off the top of your head. Yes, sir. Right. And we see that all the way through the Bible. So you can show them from the Old Testament how no, he's, he still shows he's, he's loving and he's compassionate all the way through. It's the same God uh, over, uh, over the course of the whole of Scripture. So helping us understand that God exists as triunity from beginning, uh, from, well, from eternity past uh, through eternity future is so important for us, even as we see this playing out in our own culture, where people want to pit the God of the Old Testament against the God of the New Testament and want to embrace a, a false theology, a false doctrine. So as we uh, move on, there are a few definitions that we just kind of want to cover briefly. Um, the first is the definition that we get in uh, Grudem's text. He, he defines the Trinity in this way. God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God, and there is one God. 
uh, I, I, we have children and we, we use catechisms. I think I told you guys that the first time that we did this. Uh, catechisms are question and answer where we help teach theology. Uh, and one of the questions is this, how many persons are there in God? This is from the New City Catechism. It's a, uh, an updated version of, of an older catechism. How many persons are there in God? There are three persons in the one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the same in substance, equal in power and glory. So before we work through what Grudem shows us, I want to show you a graphic that, that I think can help us in getting our bearings. So this is, a, this is something that is extremely helpful uh, to kind of visualize what that statement says, what that statement is showing us, all right? So that there is one God, okay? The, there is one God who exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In this, we recognize that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son, nor is the Holy Spirit the Son, nor is the Holy Spirit the Father. So we see in a graphic form, three persons in one God and how they are similar, how they are the same in their, pers- in their essence, but they are, they are distinct in their beings. They're distinct in their, in their persons. So with these definitions, let's jump into the first of these categories, the first of these claims. The scriptural claim that we are arguing for is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are truly distinct persons, truly distinct persons. Some scriptural support. We've seen this in uh, the Old Testament uh, in, a, in a, few, a few times as we think of um, the beginning, but we see clear indication as to these distinctions in the New Testament. First, let's consider the distinction between the Father and the Son. In John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we see a distinction. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So distinction between the two persons, the Word uh, being with God and the Word being God. We see this same Word described later in John chapter 1, uh, verse 14. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see the reality that the word who became flesh uh, was Jesus, and Jesus is God. And at the same time, the Son of God is distinct from God the Father. We also see this in John chapter, uh, John chapter 6. Whenever John, uh, or Matthew chapter six, whenever we, we think about the disciples' prayer, Jesus teaches the disciples to pray. He teaches them to pray, our Father in heaven. We see that in John 17 as well, uh, whenever Jesus prays to the Father. He doesn't pray, uh, he doesn't pray to himself. He doesn't, I didn't say, he doesn't say, I pray to myself as Father. Uh, he prays to the Father. In these passages, it is clear that the Father and the Son are distinct Persons. We also see in 1 John 2, uh, which I don't have on the screen, but 1 John 2, 1, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So Jesus Christ the righteous is distinct from the Father. Here's our advocate with the Father. What about the Holy Spirit? Is he distinct from the Father and the Son? Well, Scripture bears this out. We see this in John chapter 14. But the Helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. We also see uh, the distinction between the Spirit and the Son in John chapter 16. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. In these passages, we can conclude that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as revealed in Scripture, are truly distinct persons. Truly distinct persons. We also recognize that in this, there are errors in belief. One of those errors uh, is called modalism. Modalism. Uh, It is a heresy that uh, began in the third century with a man named Sibelius, Modalism is an inadequate view of the nature of God. 
Originally, heretics don't start out wanting to be heretics, guys. They don't. They don't just say, what can I do to depart from Orthodox Christianity? Originally, the intent of modalism was to preserve monotheism. It was an attempt to preserve the unity of God and at the same time hold to the divinity of Christ. He saw a challenge there. But the trinity of modalism is uh, a trinity of manifestation. This means that the three persons uh, or personalities, as they would call, are simply expressions of the one true God. Modalism teaches that only one God exists and that the three persons listed in the Bible, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are simply modes or manifestations of the one God. Just like you would think that a person can be a husband, a son, and a father at the same time, yet the person is only one individual. Modalists would argue that the same is true, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. However, we see that this is different than what the the scriptures teach us. Now, as we think about that, so that would mean that sometimes if modalism was true, then sometimes God would show himself as the Father. Sometimes God would show himself as the Son. Sometimes God would show himself as the Holy Spirit. Another one of those recall exercises. What is an incommunicable attribute of God that we would have to deny if we embraced modalism. An incommunicable attribute of God that we would deny if we embraced modalism. Omnipresence, okay. Okay, yeah, he's never changing, right? His immutability, that God doesn't change. He's not this one day and that the next day. He's not, he doesn't change into different forms in the sense of uh, something different than his eternal existence. Okay, so he doesn't change from father to son to Holy Spirit back to son to Holy Spirit to the Father. He doesn't do that. That would be and uh, that would be a uh, denial of his immutability. That in some way, shape, or form, God changes. Now, uh, not only do we see this simple distinction by saying uh, that we see all three, but we also know that they have different functions in relating to the world. Each member of the Trinity. Uh, functions differently in their relation, in, in, the, in God's relation to the world. The first place we see this is in creation. We see how God, his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit function differently or distinctly in their relation to creation. Genesis chapter one, the Father spoke the words to bring the universe into existence. John chapter one, verse three, uh, the son carried out this decree. We remember that uh, the word is the, the active agent in creation. The word does the creating. And in Genesis chapter one, verse two, the spirit was active in protecting and sustaining God's creation. We see that in the beginning where the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We also see this in redemption. We see this in redemption. John three sixteen, the father planned redemption and sent his son. The son obeyed the father and accomplished redemption for us. We see that in John chapter six. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And the Holy Spirit was sent by the father and the son to apply redemption. We see this most clearly in this work of regeneration that is causing us to be born again, sanctification that is uh, sealing us and making us more like Christ, and service where he gives, we have particular gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, to be used in building his kingdom. So to recap, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons and relate to the world in distinct ways. Now, I just wanna do a quick application test here, okay? Because I know I, I'm trying to make sure that we can keep this on a level where we understand that it actually is relevant in our lives. So imagine that you're part of a corporate prayer meeting, okay? And somebody begins their prayer, and this is gonna be the extent of their prayer. And this is the prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're pretty good so far. Thank you, Father, for becoming a man and for dying on the cross for my sin. And thank you, Father, for dwelling within me. Amen. Now, what do you recognize that is untrue in this statement, in this prayer? Okay, help me understand why. 
How, how, how would that be an untrue statement? Okay. 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 All right. Other, other, other areas. So yeah, Junior's right. So the, the coming and dying is distinctly something that the son of God did, right? That Jesus accomplished. So uh, the son becoming incarnate in Jesus and being Jesus and dying for our sins uh, and um, becoming a man, right? So that's unique and distinct to the second person of the Trinity, not the father. The father didn't do that. The son did that, okay? What else? What other untruth do we see in there? Yes, sir. Okay. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, on the cross, Jesus wasn't praying to himself, right? What else in this statement do you see that's untrue? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Pam. Okay. Right. That's right. So now my, my goal for this isn't for you guys to become like super prayer critiquers. So whenever you hear somebody praying, be like, oh, modalist, modalist. There he is. Get him off there. But for us to recognize that this actually does impact whenever we pray, recognizing that we are, we have to think about the reality of what God has done and who has accomplished which parts in life that we give him praise and thanks for. It helps us to become informed prayers where we pray to the right God, right? Uh, we are praying to a God who exists eternally in triunity, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each member of the Trinity interacts uh, with the world in a, in a unique and different way. So you guys are gonna probably be thinking from now on, like, what did I, did I pray like that? Like, was that mine? Um, but I would encourage you as you think about these to make sure that as you pray, you are praying consistently with a, a Trinitarian theology. All right, the next thing, scriptural, tr uh, scriptural claim. Each member of the Trinity, or each person that we've described, has the essential attribute of deity. Now, just a, a brief disclaimer here. In a couple of weeks, there'll be a whole session on the person of Christ, okay? Where we talk about uh, the person of Christ and the hypostatic union and how, God, how Jesus is God and man at the same time. We're not gonna delve into that tonight, I just want to uh, do a cursory overview, very brief, uh, where we see the deity of each member of the Trinity being disclosed, okay? That's just, that's just up front so you guys don't leave here saying, well, he didn't really dive into it that much. We will, uh, just not tonight. Uh, we see scripturally that the Father is clearly God. We see that in the Old Testament, right? So whenever we see God, the assumption is that he is the sovereign uh, Lord of o over all, clearly viewed in this way. Uh, we also see that the Son is fully God. We see that in verses such as Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. We also see that in John 1, 1 through 4, uh, where, uh, we, where John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we see a clear uh, description as we, as we look back through John chapter 1, even remembering that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, and then also we see in John 20, 28, where Thomas answered Jesus, my Lord and my God. So we see evidences in Scripture uh, that Jesus is, or the Son is fully God. He, the, the attribute of deity is ascribed to him. We also see that the Holy Spirit is fully God. We see this clearly in Acts chapter 5. Remember the situation with Ananias and Sapphira. But Peter said, uh, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. You see Peter's association or his connection uh, in the reality that Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't that he lied to a man or to some other being, but to God himself. So we see this connection to, to see that uh, the Holy Spirit is, is attributed the reality of deity, that the Holy Spirit is fully God. Now, a couple of errors in belief as it relates to this. 
Uh, the first is called subordinationism, okay? Uh, this was held by a man named Origen uh, in the late uh, second and early third centuries. He holds that the son is eternal, that is, he's not created, and he is divine, but he is not equal to the father in being or attributes. He is subordinate in being to God the father. That means that he is, he is divine, that he is not created, but he's still not like on the A-team, okay? So he's like on the JV deity list, all right? So think of it, in, and that's kind of how subordinationism works, that in his deity, he is less than the father, okay? That he is less than the father. You also have uh, a heresy called Arianism. Uh, this was by a man named Arius in the third and fourth century. Now his is different than, um, than Origen's, because Arius holds that the Son of God was at one point created by God the Father, and that before that time the Son did not exist, nor did the Holy Spirit, but the Father only, okay? So the Arian position would affirm uh, this, uh, this statement, that uh, the Son is of similar essence to the Father, but not the same essence of the Father. And there's two words that you read in your, in your reading. Uh, the one is homo, Usios, okay, which means the same essence. And the other word is homoi, usios, means a similar essence. Now, sometimes I think that we, in our church cultures today, we just sweep theology under the rug. We think it's not that important. But notice the delineating marker in these two words. One is orthodoxy and one is heresy. How many letters one letter, one letter in describing the essence of Jesus is the defining line between heresy and a not God and orthodoxy that affirms the full deity of the Lord Jesus. One vowel represents a completely different understanding of who Jesus is. Arius was happy to say that Jesus was supernatural and like God, but he could not bring himself to say that Jesus was God. Now, this is where we find our modern day heresies like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They affirm that Jesus is supernatural, but they say that he is a created being, that he is not God. So as we talk with those who are Jehovah's Witnesses, having scriptures like John chapter one, Colossians chapter two, uh, and other passages of scripture can help us to talk with them about the reality of who Jesus is. Yes, sir. Mm. They do? Yeah, it's a, that's a great, a great question. Um, and actually, I do have something. Um, let's, let's see if we can hold it to the end, okay? Because um, it's actually an article, it's a relatively lengthy article uh, called How to Use the Back of a Napkin to, Provo to Prove to a Jehovah's Witness that Jesus is God. Yeah? Yeah. John 1. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes the challenge is that. Yeah, yeah, it's in their Bible, so it has nothing to do with the interpretation of it. It has everything to do with the heart, right? Uh, and so, as we interact with people, that is one thing that we are reminded that uh, our interactions with them, though we can prove to them from Scripture, even their own copies. Uh, talking about Greek grammar rules, which if you think of John chapter one, and literally uh, there's a, a rule that, that in their scripture is not applied. Um, we could talk about that a little bit more at length, um, that, that literally no Greek scholar affirms their, their traditional piece of it. Um, and at the same time, we have opportunities to, uh, 
to pray for them and to continue sharing truth with them and helping them see uh, areas in, uh, in, in the scripture, even their own, that affirm Jesus' deity and, and helping, helping us to walk through that. So um, the, uh, the persons of the Trinity, as we see here, eternally exist as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The next, the next truth claim, uh, there is one God. There is one God. Uh, now, this one is probably the, the most accepted, right? Um, all monotheistic religions out there would affirm this. Uh, and we see that in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I will give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. We also see this in James chapter 2, verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Now this one, there are not a ton of people that apply this or, or embrace this error in theology, um, but it's called tritheism, uh, which would basically say that, well, if they all have the attributes of God, then they must all be a different God. Uh, so you have the Father God, the Son God, and the Spirit God. So really it looks like you have three gods, uh, which would be called tritheism. Um, this would, this would uh, remove the belief that each had a unique essence, or this would affirm or press on the belief that each had a unique essence and was different from the others. So as we kind of move down towards uh, the end of our evening tonight, we have a little bit of time left. The big question is this, can we understand the Trinity? Well, depends on what you mean by understand, okay? Uh, I think that uh, whenever you, when you ask that question, if you mean can we know that this is a reality, the answer is yes. Uh, we've seen from Scripture, right? So we've seen scriptural witness that there is one God. We've seen uh, in Scripture that this one God eternally exists in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and uh, they are all equally God. If you mean, can we completely comprehend how all this fits together in a perfectly linear, logical, kind of easy to package way to be able to, you know, put on a coffee cup or something, uh, then no, uh, we can't understand it in a comprehensive, perfect way. But I love what Wayne Grudem says in his book. He says, it is, it is actually spiritually healthy for us to acknowledge that God's being is far greater than we can comprehend. He said, this puts us in a place of humility. And I would also remind us that in Scripture, again, as we, it was a, a statement that I made a little earlier, that we are given the what and the why, but not always the how, okay? Uh, that is, we, we come to know what God is or who God is, why it matters that he exists in a triunity, but he doesn't explain how it necessarily works. He, he finds that it is not absolutely necessary to describe that to us. And at the same time, we have to assert that the Bible does not ask us to, uh, in, even in this doctrine, to believe contradictory statements. So the Bible doesn't ask us to believe contradictions, okay? Um, this leads us to think about uh, a helpful definition of the Trinity, that God is one essence and three persons, okay? So um, the doctrine of the Trinity is not a contradiction for God to be both three and one because he's not three and one in the same way, okay? He is not three and one in the same way. He is three in a different way than he is one. We're not saying that God is one and denying that he's one by saying that he's three. God is one and three at the same time, but not in the same way, okay? You guys tracking with me? Or are you guys like, Phew. left me there. So how is this? How is God one? He's one in essence, okay? He's one in being, how is God three? He is three in persons. So essence and person are not the same thing. Uh, since God is one in a different way than he's three, the Trinity is not a contradiction. Uh, we would be contradicting ourselves if we said that God is three in the same way that he is one, or uh, that he is, uh, yeah, that he is three in the same way that he is one. Uh, one of the ways that we think about uh, essence and person is this. Essence is what you are, person is who you are, okay? Um, so God is one what, what God is, but he is three who's, okay? There's one essence, three who's. 
It's not something that exists, that the divine essence is not something that exists above or separate from the persons, but it is, the divine essence is the being of the three persons. The three persons are not just defined by attributes added on to the being. When we think about this, we understand that there are no differences in the attributes of God at all. So the the Son of God uh, perfectly exists with all the attributes of God. The communicable and incommunicable attributes of God God exist in the person of the Son, and at the same time, they exist in the person of the Father. The difference is the way in which they relate to each other and to creation, so in their relationship with one another. The unique quality of the Father is the way he relates as Father to the Son and the Spirit for eternity. He always relates to the Son and the Spirit as the Father in relationship with them. The unique quality of the Son is the way in which he relates as Son to the Spirit and the Father. And the Spirit is unique in how he relates as Spirit to the Son and the Father. Okay, so they're unique in their relationship. They're not not unique in their essence. They are all God. They are unique in their person in the way that they relate to creation and to one another. And this is how it has been for all eternity. Now, as we kind of finish up the last, the last 14 or 15 minutes here, I just wanted to ask you guys, why does this matter? Why does the Trinity matter? I'm just going give, to give, give you guys an open floor to, to kind of say why you think the Trinity matters. Do you think it does matter? Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So salvation, right? Uh, it matters because of salvation. If we think about um, the very heart of the gospel is at stake in the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, we see that in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 uh, through 14. Paul describes God's work of salvation in terms of the three persons, right? The Father's love moved him to send Jesus to die in our place. Jesus' love moved him to die in our place and to send the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's love moved him to draw us back to the Father. Uh, this, is the, this is the gospel, that, that all three, the triune God is at work in our salvation. Yeah. What else? Yeah, yeah. I think you you touched on uh, extremely important the atonement, right? Uh, If Jesus uh, was just a good man, you're just a great teacher, then he would not be able to die on the cross to save us from our sins, because he would be dying for his own sin, right? Uh, And like you said, that there's only one one who is good. He would just have been another created being had he not been God in the flesh. So Jesus can make atonement for us because he is fully God. Uh, He can stand in the gap because he is deity. Um, So our security and salvation is based on that, right? So if if Jesus isn't who he says that he was, if he didn't do what he said that he did, then we have no no confidence for our standing before God. Um, We have no confidence on on which we we can put any hope. Yeah. What else? What are the reasons that it matters? Okay. Yeah. So there would be no way for the spirit to uh, to change our, our. There would be no way for us to be changed from the inside out. Or, or we would be able to have a new heart. Um, Jesus could accomplish salvation. Uh, the Father could have sent Jesus, but the Spirit is the one that gives us new life. So yeah, that's. And he has to. I mean, 
Yeah, absolutely. It's not just a, a, an impersonal force that just kind of moves things around. As a personal being, it is God who is regenerating us to become more like, more like God, more like Christ. What else? Are there reasons that it matters? What else do you guys think? What about, what about prayer? It matters because of, of prayer. Uh, scripture teaches us to pray to the Father, right? Our Father in heaven. It teaches us to pray uh, in Jesus' name and with the help of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if, if Jesus, if the Trinity didn't exist, Jesus' uh, work, even we think about that, um, praying in his name gives us confidence that the Father hears our prayers. If you think about that, that's uh, so, so important. Jesus paid for our sins to prove that God loves us. He suffers what we deserve so that we can be adopted into God's family and so that we know that he hears us. The Spirit gives us strength to pray. He helps us whenever we don't even know what to pray because he knows how to ask according to the will of God because he knows the mind of God because he is God. So he intercedes on our behalf according to the will of God. What else? Other things. What about worship? What about uh, the reality that uh, people around the world assume that Muslims, Jews, and Christians worship the same God? We look at the scripture, we recognize that the Muslims and the Jews don't worship the same God. We, we, we worship a triune God. Non-Messianic Jews and Muslims profess a monopersonal God rather than the tripersonal God uh, of the Bible. This distinction is critical Monopersonal God could not be eternally loving and gracious. Before the creation, he would not have loved anything. Right? But we see in a triune God, an eternal relationship of love that is now expressed as God uh, works in, as he created the world, and also in working in our salvation. We, we believe, as we think about worship, uh, that God uh, never has nor will change. We also believe that God is love. So the Trinity explains how God was loved before he created anything. They eternally loved one another. Um, and uh, we see that it is different from polytheism, like Hinduism and Buddhism and things like that, uh, in the sense that there is one God. Uh, world religions, as we think about world religions, continue to multiply. Uh, and against this tide of universalism, uh, this distinctive, uh, will only become more essential in how we communicate our faith and how we worship God rightly. We worship him as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't just worship him as, uh, as the Father. We worship him as the triune God. What else? Any other things that you guys can think of? I have a few more here uh, to, to put on there if you're, if you're wondering other things, why it matters. Um, matters about, again, worship, but think about the places in the Bible where we are encouraged to bow down and worship Jesus, right? If Jesus isn't God, then somewhere along the way, we're being commanded to worship a creature. This doesn't square with, uh, with what we see in other places in the Bible. So we're, we're commanded, even as we saw in Isaiah chapter 42, that God will not share his glory with anyone else. And so if Jesus isn't God, then we are, we are false worshipers. We are worshiping false gods, um, in that. The personal nature of God, we, we see that even in that, uh, this flows our ability to interpersonally relate to each other. If God wasn't eternally existing in a triune relationship, then we would have no basis for interpersonal relationships with each other. Our relationships in community are patterned after God's relationship with himself uh, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the other, the, the last one that Grudem picks up is the, the universe, he's basically the universe would come undone. Um, I mean, because of the fact that there is not really unity uh, with yourself, right? Uh, so there is an interpersonal unity uh, with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, which is the basis for uh, a unity in creation, that the world exists in a unified way. Apart from that, uh, there is no basis for Really, really that kind of a function. Think about a sanctification. We've talked about that one. Apart from the Spirit's work in us um, as God, uh, creating in us and making us more like Jesus. Uh, Christian living. Think about our relationships, how we would even live as husband and wife. And it's patterned off of the 
the, the Trinitarian relationship in, uh, in how that works. Uh, evangelism. We would have no confidence that God could save anybody. We would know what we're talking about whenever we're sharing the gospel with people. Um, there are just so many ways in which the Trinity is absolutely vital and essential in our, in our lives. Um, and as we think about even challenges to that, making sure that we continue to, to share with this, a lot, of, a lot of the challenges, I mean, in our interactions would be things that we'll be talking about a little bit later with Jesus, but how to prove that he is God uh, from the scripture. Um, that would be a defense against Islam, right? So that would say Jesus is not God, uh, or Jehovah's Witnesses that say Jesus is uh, a created being, God-like, but not God. Um, and as you even think about um, Latter-day Saints or, or Mormonism and, and their belief about who Jesus is as well. So these are all uh, opportunities for us to continue to grow in our understanding of who God is and apply this doctrine of the Trinity in our own worship, our own prayers, and our own uh, personal sanctification. So let's pray, and, uh, and then we will be dismissed. Lord, we thank you so much for today and for your grace in our lives. Thank you, uh, Father, for sending Jesus uh, to die in our place. And, and Jesus, we thank you that you chose to humble yourself um, to be obedient to the point of death, uh, even death on a cross. Spirit, I, we praise you today even that, uh, you, um, that you regenerate us, that you give us new life that you indwell us. And Father, we we thank you that you have providentially planned and purposed these things, these truths uh, for your glory uh, from eternity past. And we we thank you for that. We praise you for your kindness and your grace and your mercy. And we pray that you would help us to understand you rightly and apply that in our lives uh, so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.